Church on the Rise would like to welcome you to the Ministry of the Word. We pray that it will help you find the will of God more clearly in your life. Well, Genesis 42, starting at verse 6. <clears throat> Since Joseph was the governor of all Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all the people, it was to him that his brothers came. It was the time of drought, of course, and uh, they had finally run out of food. So they came down and uh, they came to, to Joseph. When they, had, uh, when they arrived, they bowed before him with their faces to the ground. Joseph recognized his brothers instantly, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where are you from? he demanded. From the land of Canaan, they replied, we have come to buy food. Then in verse 8, although Joseph recognized his brothers, they didn't recognize him. And he remembered the dreams he'd had about them many years before. Then we jump over to, to chapter 45 and I'll just read the first few verses of that. Now this, uh, this is after a period where Joseph tested his brothers so he sent them home to his father and uh, one of them stayed behind. Finally Benjamin uh, came and uh, he put the silver cup in Benjamin's bag and the whole thing and tested him out and he tested his brothers to see what they would do with Benjamin. And uh, they said, we can't leave Benjamin behind. We, we left our other brother behind once and it almost killed our father and so we can't we can't do that and uh, so they said we're not we can't go without Benjamin and at that Joseph it said in in chapter 45 verse 1 Joseph could stand it no longer there were many people in the room and he said to his attendants out all of you so he was alone with his brothers when he told them who he was. Then he broke down and wept, and he wept so loudly the Egyptians could hear him, and word of it quickly carried to Pharaoh's palace. I am Joseph, he said to his brothers. Is my father still alive? But his brothers were speechless. They were stunned to realize that Joseph was standing there in front of them because they'd thought he was dead and gone. Please come closer, he said to them. So they came closer, and he said again, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last for five more years and there will be neither ploughing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh, the manager of his entire palace and the governor of all of Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and tell him. Father, we just pray that uh, your word, the principles of your word, will help us do life well. And Lord, help us in our family and in our relationships, one with the other. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Joseph here is some, uh, it's about 15 years later, this story, because Joseph was around about 17 when he had his dreams and he was taken by his brothers and uh, sold off. He was 30 years of age when uh, he became the Prime Minister and there uh, are two years now in, into uh, this famine. In fact, he'd be more than that because they had seven good years. So, um, you know, it, it was quite, it would have been almost 20 years um, since he saw his brothers. That is a long time to be disconnected with family. It would be a long time for Joseph if his heart hadn't have been right or if he hadn't have processed what had happened to him well 
it would have been a long time for bitterness and anger to rise. Can you imagine after all those years, finally these brothers of mine are here and they are going to pay for this. But we see a man whose life God had got a hold of and he responded to his brothers so well. And uh, certainly the story of Joseph helps us understand the person of Jesus, that even though we have sinned against God, God has provided salvation for us and, and granted us his grace and his mercy. It's a wonderful story. It's a story of grace. It's a story of family. And uh, it's a story that um, helps us so much. You know, I think relationships very much is a bit like the zoo sometimes, because like living in the zoo, you know, there's always elephants that are treading on your toes. There's always that big giraffe in the room that's got that big long neck, you know, and they just look down at you. There's that bird that flies over that poops on you. As monkeys getting up to mischief, you know, life can be sometimes like the zoo. And uh, we have to try and navigate that and understand it and work it through. And so here, Joseph certainly had to do that in his life and, and navigate his way in God. You know, Jesus uh, clearly said to us that the whole law is wrapped up in love God and love your neighbour, or love people. And hence our little slogan, as you drive in, you'll see on our board there, loving God, loving people, loving life. Loving people is a reflection of our life with God, or the measure that we can relate to people, oftentimes is a reflection of our love for God. Some people can say, well, I, I really love God, but people, yeah, well, that's another story. But it can't actually work that way because our, our lives are very much linked one to another. And I just want to say people are the most beautiful creation in all the world. Everybody say, I am beautiful. Let's just start off with a very positive note here this morning and just say, you know, I just, I love being around people, you know. I just think it's a wonderful zoo. I just think, uh, you know, there's nothing like sitting in the mall with a cup of coffee and just watching the parade go past. And everybody's got their look, they got their way, and they've all got a story to tell. It's just brilliant. I just love sitting down and hearing people's stories. And, uh, you know, really, when God made us, you know, when he made the animals, he said, that's good. But when he made you and me, he said, that's very good. You're very good. And uh, I reckon, you know, just to be alone in the world without people would be a horrible, empty space, wouldn't it? You know, thank God for creation. Thank God for the animals. But Adam was a very lonely man until Eve came along. And then he said, oh, here's a woo man. Woo man. Woo man. When he saw her, this is my woo man. And so God created us to be together. We were meant to live together. We were meant to do life together. We're better together. The first sin really after Adam and Eve, was, was Cain killing Abel. Isn't it interesting that the first sin was that? You know, he didn't steal something from him. He didn't lie to him. He just killed him. <laughs> but it just tells me that, you know, right from the word go in, in, in the history of man, that the devil wants to divide and separate and spoil what God wants, because we need family. We need to be together. We need to have a spiritual family. We need to have our own family. As I was preparing this message yesterday, I just thought about my family, and my mum and dad are here. And, I, and you know, mum and dad, there was never a day that I didn't want to come home. There was never a day. And, and that's a big thing for a kid, isn't it? You know, you... you 
maybe you all had brilliant families like I have, but there's, there's a lot of people that just sometimes as kids, they just didn't want to go home because of the strife, the dysfunction in the family. But thank God for good families. And thank God that he can help us build families because families are the foundation of our society and uh, they're really the foundation of all that happens. And so we, we need to protect them, we need to work uh, with one another. And so to, to love God means also to love people. It's interesting that the life of Jesus, it says, as he grew in, in wisdom and stature, but he also grew in favour with God and, and man. And so you can see the two together, that, that there was a favour on Jesus. The people loved Jesus. You know, well, at, one day they were singing his praises, next day they were saying, crucify him. So the crowd can be a bit fickle at times. But generally, the people loved Jesus. He, he didn't have a problem getting a crowd. He had a problem sometimes getting away from the crowd because he connected so well with people and he grew in favour and the Holy Spirit was on him. But you look at the story of, of, of the man with the evil spirits, you know, the demoniac whose, whose place was the cemetery and he had no friends, he had no connection. And so Satan wants to drive people away from us. And you will find that throughout life, there's things that happen that try to divide us. There will be stuff that comes along in the life of our church that tries to divide us. Can I say, family, as your pastor, let it not divide us, but it let, it, let it unite us. You know, I had to speak to two people this week you know, when I say to speak, I had a talk with them and say, don't let the non-essentials rule our lives. Let, let the essentials of the Word of God rule our lives. But let's not be divided in the non-essentials. There's always stuff that we will disagree on. We won't all, always agree on everything. And I say praise the Lord to that because it gives us some good discussion. Should we have smoke machines in church? <laughs> Angel. So Angel gets on. Be quiet, Angel. I'm preaching. <laughs> so, you know, should we, have, should we have smoke machines in church? You know, well, you know, back... Uh, the, the great thing is, is when you've lived in church life, like I have all my life, I was in church before I was born. And so, you know, you just see all these things come through. There was a big issue. Should we have drums in church? Some people left. When, when they brought drums into the church because they only have drums in pubs and guitars and whatever and so we can't have them in church because the church is going to the world. Who was there in those days? Some of you are looking at me like a horse at a new gate and saying, it, really? <laughs> when dancing came into the church, there was a whole big issue, you know, just, well... That's how we used to do it. We used to call it the kangaroo hop. But David danced before the Lord. And so, you know, finally we're getting some stuff back into the church that we lost. But don't let the non-essentials take us and divide us. Can I have an amen on that? Because I want to tell you, I want to tell you, prophetically, stuff like that will come. It'll, it'll come. But let's work together. Let's understand each other and hold to the fundamentals of the Word. We believe in the Bible. We believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Come on. We believe in the baptism uh, in, in water. We believe in those things, and they're the things that will hold us together, and we can work through the other stuff in Jesus' name. Do you know... They did a survey with married couples years ago when they were going through their difficulties and the ones that had got divorced. And uh, many of the couples said, we wished we had have tried harder to work it through now looking back because we thought just by leaving it would be all over. And I think in church life, sometimes you've you got to have that same thought. Oh, no, let's, let's really try and work it through. Look, if something gnaws away at you and you can't get happy after 12 months, well then, hey, that, that could be a different story. 
But, but in God, we need to make it work because we're better together and the enemy wants to divide. So let's just have a look at a couple of things here before we, we have the dedication today. First thing is, what, what do we do with conflict? When conflict comes, do, of course, Joseph um, was in conflict with his brothers to the point where they hated him, they sold him off, and uh, he had that conflict. Firstly, conflict is inevitable. You can't go through life and not have conflict with other people. There, there was, in my teenage years and growing up as a young pastor, I thought, you know, if I only get holy enough and get smart enough and, and uh, you know, become the man of God, there'll be no conflict. But then I thought Jesus was absolutely perfect and he had a whole lot of conflict to the point where they crucified him. And so conflict, you, you know, you don't go looking for trouble, but I don't think we should be surprised when trouble comes because that's life. We live in a broken world and you know what? None of us are quite perfect yet. We're close, aren't we? But we're not quite perfect. And because you and I aren't perfect, there will be conflict. There will be issues. There will be stuff that comes up. And so let's not be surprised. And, and uh, you know, I think one of our college lecturers used to say, you know, when conflict comes, don't react. Respond. Everybody say, respond. respond. Don't react. So in, in your nervous system, in your mind, in your whole world, you know, when conflict comes, say, yeah, okay, it's, it's here. So I'm going to respond to this. Joseph responded to the conflict. He didn't react towards it. Did you uh, see, um, who's Trump? Trump, uh, Donald Trump. Who loves Donald Trump? So... So he gets, into a, he gets into an argument with somebody over, I forget what it was, and uh, he, he turned to the interviewer and he sa Trump said, yeah, well, he started it. <laughs> so, you know, you can, you can react so much instead of responding. And so by, by responding to, to that, and, and Joseph recognised that life wasn't fair, that his brothers were cruel and evil, you know, he said to his brothers, you meant it for evil. He did say that to his brothers. So he wasn't trying to live in some airy-fairy denial kind of world. He actually looked at his brothers and said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. So he processed it. And when stuff comes your way, yeah, well, that's, that's, that was meant for evil. But hey... I'm going to look on the positive side. God meant it for good. God, you are in this. And so stuff will happen and uh, conflict is inevitable. It's conflict is not always bad. God can use it in our life. Conflict tests us. Tests us in patience, forgiveness and understanding. You know, when, uh, when stuff comes, it does test what's inside of you. When you're confronted with conflict, it actually tests your patience. Will I forgive that person? Am I going to show understanding? My father's here again today, so I'll tell a story that you'll remember. We were at the poultry farm in Moonby, and uh, we used to tip the manure out on, into the paddock. And we had a fair bit of manure at the time because Dad was putting up a new shed every week, almost. And uh, we had about 100,000 meat chickens at the time. And so uh, we had another poultry farmer beside us. And we, we were tipping this manure out. And some of the manure went over onto his property. It actually ran through the fence. And so um, I... I was the son who was out there tipping it and I saw him coming over and uh, I think I said I need to get my father here real quick because I could see the way he was coming over and so dad came over and this this guy this farmer came over and his face literally went red you know how people's face goes red and so I was just a young I was about 16 17 at the time 
And uh, his face went red and then he just took off like a, a bullet, you know. He just, just spewed it all out to the point, you know, where he was frothing at the mouth. He was literally frothing at the mouth and I thought, if this guy had a gun, we'd all be dead right now. <laughs> but I, it, it, it really, you know, amazed me how wild people can get it actually affected me at the time as a young bloke because people can get get really nasty. They can get so full. I don't know whether he was jealous of what was happening in our our world. It was just that point. He was a poultry farmer. What's a bit of manure across these? That's what I thought. But, you know, he, he was so vehement about the whole thing but my father I remember every time I'd see him then from there I thought you know you mongrel that's what I thought <laughs> I wasn't in the ministry then I was allowed to say it then <laughs> so. but I remember my father actually making keeping the peace and making friends you know with him and, and life went on and so no matter what people do Let's not get down to their level. That's the point I'm trying to make. Let's not, you know, react and, and uh, let's, let's respond in a godly way and uh, we can see our lives grow through. So that conflict will test us. Conflict should grow us like trees. When the winds come and the storms come, the roots go down deeper. And so in it all, I believe our prayer can be when trouble comes, Lord, Grow me through this. Who wants a bit of trouble? <laughs> I don't go looking for trouble anymore. But I do want to grow. And we grow mostly through pain. You grow very little through our successes. But pain causes us to grow. You know, when I get on the wrong side of my wife, it really causes me to grow a whole lot. <laughs> grow up fast. And so, you know, it, it don't, don't, if you're in trouble with, with the situation, don't say, my life is over. It's finished. No, it's not. God's going to grow you bigger and stronger in the name of Jesus. And your challenge in that situation will cause you to grow in God and the goodness and the wisdom of God. So make that your prayer. Don't say, my life is over. Say, God, use this in my life to grow me in Jesus' name. Relationships are emotional, so there's, there's going to be conflict in relationship. There's going to be emotion in relationship. In this story here of Joseph, you see that he's holding back the tears. You know, and so you've got 20 odd years of, of, of emotion here, and finally it said he could not contain himself any longer, and he bursts out and he bawls like a great big baby. He cried so loud, the Bible says, all the house of Egypt heard him. And so, you know, this is emotional release in, in Joseph. This is, this is connection. And uh, it's important to recognise that we are emotional beings and that we need to connect with one another. You know, as a child, we, we aren't like a chicken that's born in an egg that's distant from our mothers. We, we are born in our mother's womb. And we are created in our mother's womb. And, and already, you know, the, the tests that they... I saw one mother the other day putting uh, the speaker on her tummy so she would give the baby some sound, you know. She was playing some music. And, uh, you know, the, the whole connection with the child and the parents even in that formative stage, is quite powerful. And then uh, the whole connection as the child is born. You know, children are the most helpless of all creation. The little, uh, a little baby has to be shown how to drink and, and uh, cared for. And, and this creates this, this connection one with another, and that's a strong emotional connection. So that's why we are so affected when things go wrong because we are strongly connected one with one another emotionally. We feel deeply about family. We feel 
far less about things. You know, it's not your dishwasher or lawnmower breaking down that's going to wreck your life. It's a, it's a father that wasn't there or a dysfunctional family or a whole lot of verbal abuse. You know, all those things destroy. But uh, on the positive side, we can be so affirming to one another. And so our, our relationships are, are, are very much emotional. You know, they talk about IQ and EQ. People, are success, people who are successful have a high emotional quota. Understand your emotions, like that baby there, right? Understand your emotions and are in touch with your feelings. We relate to people and understand their feelings. We can read them. And so uh, emotionally connecting with people, we need to understand our own emotions. Why, why am I so upset when that person comes around? Or why am I so upset when, when, when I'm in that group? And so we connect with, with our emotions and with our feelings. Our emotions are in, incredible things. It's, we're all wired, really, as one. You know, we are body, soul and spirit. I think I told you the story that one, uh, one morning I went over to pray and I was just emotionally, you know, upset and I was crying as I was praying and I didn't know why I was, I was crying. And I went back over to Rhonda and I said, you know, is it, is it, uh, is it any special days today? Is it the kid's birthday or something? Because we'd lost our two children, for those who don't know. And, and uh, I said, you know, is it our kid's birthday? And she said, no, no, it wasn't. That. So I went off to work. Anyway, she rang me later and what was it? It was, it was Christy's birthday on that day and yet I didn't know it. Mentally, I didn't know it was her birthday but yet spiritually, emotionally, I did. Isn't that incredible? I just find that amazing how our emotions can be so connected to our world even more than our mind is. And it all works together and so it, it helps to think through that. Why am I upset? You know, why do I react? And so you try and think it through and pray it through and I tell you, God helps you unwind some of those broken, uh, you know, events in our life. And so emotionally, and so for me, I, 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 I would say that I didn't actually get in touch with, really with my emotions till I was about 40, 45, where I had to start thinking, am I in touch with myself? It sounds a bit girly, boys. Because the women do it well, but the blokes don't always do it that well. We're so task orientated. We don't always think and, and go a little bit deeper. But just bring out your feminine side, boys. Just get in touch with who you are. And then uh, I tell you, it's, it's brilliant because then you will be able to make decisions that help, you know. And so if you're feeling a bit emotional, you know, you might, you just might be overdoing it. You're, you're, you might be, it might be too much work and not enough play. Hello? The life-work balance. Who's got that right? You know, it's a challenge, you know, to get it all right. To get it, but your emotions will help you understand where you're at in all that and then you can make choices. I'm having a week off. I'm having a month off. No, I'm taking all year off. <laughs> I'm having the rest of my life off. There was one point where I, because I, I began to connect with my emotions and I said to our board, I'm having a month off. I hadn't had holidays all year, so I need four weeks off. If you're physically tired and emotionally drained, sometimes the best thing that you can do is have a whole month off because this is how it works. The first week off, you wind down. If you only have two weeks off, at the end of the first week, you're saying to yourself, I've got to go back to work next week. But you wind down the first week, then you have the next two weeks, and they are glorious. And then on the last week, your mind already is starting to say, I've got to be back at work, I've got to be doing this. 
And so it's, it's, it's extremely good to have some long periods of time. You know, they used to rest the land every seven years. They'd rest it for quite a period of time. And, uh, you know, some of us just need some more rest with our emotions because we're just worn out. It all just happens. And uh, anyway, the point is, in relationship, we are emotional beings. We are connected and uh, it, it makes a big difference. Psalm 131, in fact, the psalmist there talks about IQ and EQ. And he says, IQ, he says, we got it there. I don't concern myself with matters too great or too awesome for me to grasp. So don't try and be smarter than what you are. I tried once and failed dismally. <laughs> now I'll let Pastor Paul do all the hard <laughs> intellectual work around the place. And then here's EQ. Instead, I have calmed and quieted myself like a weaned child who no longer cries for his mother's milk. Well, he's given an example there of that. But he's saying, I understand myself. I understand my IQ and my EQ. Lastly this morning, how should we respond? Well, there's th three different ways that uh, we often respond one is, I'll get even. Two, I'll get out. Or thirdly, I'll be a peacemaker. Just quickly, firstly, I'll get even. So in responding to people's uh, hate or evil or whatever it is, conflict, you can say, and people do say, I I I'll get even, I'll get back, I'll, I'll get you back. I think I said that to my brothers a few times. I'll get you back, because that's the instant carnal response. I'll pay you back. But the Bible says, everybody says the Bible says. <laughs> Romans twelve nineteen. Why don't we read that together? Now uh, this verse, you need to quote this verse when somebody's really hurt you and you just want to get them back. You need to quote this verse. And I quite like this verse because it says, leave that to the righteous anger of God. <laughs> God can get angry. You know, he's, he can get angry and just look at history. And uh, he's, he says, I will pay them back, says the Lord. You know, Right now, we are living in a period of grace. And, and people, you look at people, you think, oh, they're just getting off scot-free. If they don't repent from their ways, they aren't getting off scot-free. Because judgment day is coming. And unless they receive the grace and mercy of God, they will have to pay for their sins. If they won't allow Jesus to pay for their sins on the cross, they will have to pay for their own sins. And so, you know, when, when you're in a situation where someone has really done the wrong thing by you, don't try and get even. Just say, God, that, that is up to you. You are, you are the judge. And the judge of all the earth will do right. You know what? That'll help your soul and your spirit. Because, you know, you won't be saying anymore, oh, well, they're just going to get off scot-free. No, they won't. Pray the grace of God and pray that they'll come to repentance. We paid, the church paid a bill to a tradesman. That's as close as I'm going to tell you. We paid it twice. There's about 1300 bucks owing that this guy hasn't paid back. And it gets up my crawl sometimes because I think it's hard enough paying the church bills as it is and who'd rip off a church? You know, I'm thinking, let's get him. And so, so I've, I've actually been walking this little journey over the last couple of months Think now what am I going to do with this guy? I just feel like saying, hey, buddy, you know, that's people's ties. You, you're robbing God. Where's the fear of God in you, you know? But I've had to say, Lord, just, just show me, help me through this. And so I've, I've begun to pray for the guy because 
He's got a problem. If he's ripping the church off, who else is he ripping off? Has he got a gambling problem? He's got a problem. So I've started saying, Lord, help this man. And so I, I phoned him the other day and we, we talked. It's about the only phone call I've got through. And I tried to help him say, you know, the Bible says that owe no man anything. The Bible says that don't owe any, anybody anything unless, you know, you've got a deal worked out. It's okay to pay your mortgage with the bank because you've got the deal. But if, if something should be paid for the bible says pay it and i said look i'm saying that to you for your sake not mine because i want you know you to do well in life and it's a principle in life yeah 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 okay yeah well all right we'll work it out that was a month ago <laughs> but you know there's there's all this stuff happening out there and and in our lives we can take a line and we can try and control and get revenge and whatever, but I just believe, we, you know, in, in a lot of cases, we need to leave it to God to deal with the judgment side and pray for the person. You know, pray for them that persecute you, the Bible says. Hello? They're not going to tell you that on Facebook. They're not going to tell you that on Sunrise. Pray for them that persecute you. Bless them that. Please notice that in conflict and all these situations, you don't take a neutral place. You just don't try and ignore it. You've got to fight it. But you fight it in prayer. You fight it in blessing. You fight it through. And, and you'll find that in that, there comes great release for your life and for your spirit and uh, for God. Amen. So don't... Don't get even. Leave that to God. Secondly, I'll get out. Well, you're out of my life. You're gone. Goodbye. That's how some people leave churches. None of you, of course, because you're all still here. But in relationships, you know, you're gone. See you later. They just wipe you off. Well, you know, sometimes you do have people do have to leave. It's sad, but sometimes people do have to leave. David had to get away from Saul. And, and in some situations, it's so toxic, it's no good for you. And so there is a place for that. But let's not write people off too early. Amen? Thank God he never wrote me off. Thank God he never wrote you off. We tend to dump people and brand people too easily. Lastly, and most importantly, I'll be a peacemaker. A peacemaker doesn't mean you're going to be a doormat for everybody to walk over, but it does mean that you're going to seek to make peace in that situation. That's the life of Joseph. That's the heart of Jesus. Is the heart of God, is to bring peace into these situations. Good relationships can only be built on trust. And it's interesting that the way Joseph approached his brothers, he tested them, saying, oh, I'm going to have a look at you guys and see if you've changed over the last 20 years. So he, he did a few tests. Good relationship can only be built on trust. If trust is broken, it has to be restored. And so the good thing about long-term pastors in churches is that trust is built. When I was here 12 months ago, you looked at me and I looked at you and, uh, and you all said, now, what's this bloke like? 12 months later, there's, there's a portion of trust there. In seven years' time... By the grace of God, there's going to be a whole lot of trust and a whole lot of faith. And uh, that's how marriages work. That's how families work. In a great way, you can trust and love people, where you can, uh, you know, work and uh, enjoy one another's company. And so thank God for good relationships. We trust you've enjoyed the ministry of the Word. And if you'd like more details or how to contact our church and its resources, look at our website www.churchontherise.org.au.